Now we can begin, as my niece once said, um, when I was doing something for her school. So let me, uh, I gave you that welcome. Let me just tell you quickly about who I am. You've been hearing me talk here. Um, I've been an amateur astronomer for a very long time. I do lots of volunteer work. I do some volunteer work at the Somerset County 4-H. And like John said, I also do volunteer talks for NASA, JPL. They're very smart. What they do is they find people who like space and astronomy like myself, and they let us listen in on conference calls with the real scientists. And then they give us PowerPoints and information, and we go forth and uh, distribute their word. So we do that on a no-fee basis, and so they get some free uh, advertisement, and we get, we get to do what we like to do. So if you have anybody here needs uh, someone to come talk to us, um, we'd be glad to uh, come out to your school or library or whatever. Okay? All right. So that's enough about me. The International Space Station. Okay? A lot of us, when we were growing up, uh, we're thinking something like this. We've seen films like 2001 Space Odyssey, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, everything. There's always a space station in it. It's a big, fantastic thing. And a lot of times it was a big rotating structure like this because they figured, well, we've got to get gravity on it somewhere. So I know if we spin things up like that, that'll cause gravity. Well, the thing is, in principle, that works. But the thing is, to really get any kind of a gravity that would hold us down, it would have to be spinning at a tremendous speed, and you would pass out from nausea. So the whole spinning idea is great for science fiction, but doesn't work in practice. And so what we wind up with is something what we have today, which is a pretty fantastic feature. Let me just move over to this side so this people can see. Am I still OK, Jim, from over here? Am I still OK over here? This is OK standing here? Excellent. Okay. <laughs> Just remember, everybody, we're live on YouTube. <laughs> there you go. So be careful of your questions or become, become notable with your questions. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of questions, at any time you have a question, just sing out. If I don't see you, just say, Paul, I got a question. Okay. And we'll give it the best shot we can. I've got a bunch of wordy slides here. We'll get through those quickly. But the International Space Station, which I will, which I will call ISS from now on, is, a, uh, is a, a consortium of about 15 nations uh, throughout the world. There are five major nations that are working on this, US, Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe. Europe has their own space agency called ESA, European Space Agency. And so all those countries you see listed below there are part of ESA. Uh, and if you've listened to anything in the news about the landing on the Rosetta Comet, that was all done by ESA. So it's a very active space, uh, space agency as well. And so it all got started back in 1978 with the first two modules. Uh, these were brought up all by spaceships. The one on the right was Unity, brought up by the space shuttle. Uh, the one on the left is Zarya, brought up by a Russian rocket. All started in 1998. They connected them together. Bingo, we had our first space station. And uh, uh, a little while later, another module was added. And we finally had astronauts actually working on board this small, tiny little two-module space station. Wasn't much. But it was a start. And all these elements were added year after year after year. It took over 10 years to finally put it all together. But it was many, many space shuttle flights, uh, 28 of them, Russian flights, European flight. Jap uh, Japanese also had a flight that brought uh, uh, in, uh, cargo to the space station. So all these things had to be done over the uh, next 10 or 12 years after that. Lots and lots of spacewalks. And when astronauts, and when I say astronauts, I do mean cosmonauts and the European astronauts as well, all those space flyers. There was about 24 we call expeditions now uh, uh, that have gone to it to create and put together the space station. And so just a little uh, chronology here. I'll just take you through a time capsule. There's 2002. Look how big the space shuttle is you know, compared to the small space station that had uh, started right there. And then, uh, then the solar panels were added. Solar panels provides what? Power. power, right, electricity. That's where they get their power from, great. One set of uh, cells like that produces about 20,000 kilowatts of power. Um, now you can see there's a central truss going right down the middle there. And that's actually the living quarters. That's the pressurized area. And there's a, uh, uh, a spaceship on the bottom. And that's how they get back and forth. This is again back in 2006. 2007, another group of solar panels was added. More panels, 2008. 
more segments. And finally, the full complement of four sets of solar panels. So 4 times 20 is 80. So we got 80 kilowatts of power. It's a lot of power, but it has a lot of instruments on that station. Um, and 2009, adding more segments. That's if you want to really play the game and see all the hundreds, not hundreds, but dozens of different parts. And finally, where we are today, which is the full complement, it's officially completed. And uh, as you can see, it just about looks like the size of an entire football field. If you're interested in the numbers, it's almost a million pounds of mass. And um, what are these other things? So it's 350 by 160 feet. Four or five bedroom house is the, is uh, it's about as big as a Boeing 747, if you put it that way. And why are we doing this? Okay, so it's there and it's flying around uh, in space. It's in orbit and it's at a constant rate of 17,500 miles an hour. Why that speed? Because if it was any slower, it would fall into the Earth. If you went any faster, it would skip off the Earth into space. So it's got to be just at that right speed. Anybody know how long it takes to orbit the Earth? Once. I know? Okay, about 90 minutes, about 90 minutes to orbit the Earth. So they have many, many sunrises and sunsets every day, uh, every one of our days. But the whole reason for doing this is not because we can. The whole reason we're doing this is for us. It's the, spa it's the station above helping us here on Earth. We're learning about our bodies. We're learning about how things work. But on top of all of that, we want to know how it is to work and live in space. That's the key thing. If we want to go farther, if we want to go back to the moon, if we want to go out to Mars, out to an asteroid, or beyond, we're going to be in space for a long time. When I say we, I mean astronauts. I just think of myself as a wannabe astronaut, okay? I'm not. I'm not, okay? I wish I was. But the thing is, is that we don't know what it's like to live in space, and so we needed a platform to stay up there for extended periods of time. And that's really the main reason. I remember when the station was first thought of, they were saying, oh, we're going to make fantastic crystals up there in, in microgravity that's going to help us cure things and do all kinds of wonderful things. Indeed, there are a lot of human benefits that are coming out of the space station experiments, but the main reason is to learn how to live and work in space. So all these areas are being investigated for sure. Um, just a little bit more about the mechanics. Again, it's the center structure that you see going right down a, a long tube there. That's the living area. You could literally float and fly from one end to the other, sort of like Superman or Supergirl. And every now and then you can go online and you can see one of the astronauts doing it just for fun. They kind of just float and fly all the way through just to give themselves and us a thrill. One of the largest segments that was added almost last was a Japanese segment. It's with the biggest one there, you can see on the lower left, it even has a second compartment on top. And it has something interesting. It has a porch that stays out in space with that mechanical arm you see there. And that's where they can do experiments out in the vacuum of space to see what happens to materials in space. Um, that's actually what it was on the ground. You can see how big it is compared to the people. Um, there's the astronauts that uh, assembled it in space. You can see it just fit into the cargo bay of the shuttle at the time. And when you do get to go up in space on a space shuttle, which we don't do anymore, there was usually about seven crew uh, people on the space shuttle. So you have seven on the shuttle. And anybody know how many people are in the space station right now? What's the standard complement? Do you know? Six. We went up to six. Okay, that's pretty good. So there's six on the space station at all times now. And when we had a visiting crew of seven, that was 13 people. That's a lot of people in space. And so this is one where there was only three on the space station, and that's the shuttle crew uh, right behind them. And by the way, this is why I lost all my hair, because in case I go into space, I don't have to have, <laughs> I don't have, to have that problem, OK? Uh, and like I said, that's 13 people when you add them all up. That's a lot of people all on the space station at one time. You might wonder how it, how it controls its motion. It's floating, but you know when we see things floating in space, they're kind of flobbling all over the place. Well, you can't do that with space stations, so they have these huge gyroscopes on them there. They call them control moment gyroscopes, and there's four of these, and they're spinning at an amazing amount of revolutions. And by having them in the space station like that, it keeps the station steady at all times. 
Now, one of the first, you know, the title of this talk is Living on the Space Station, and that's the whole thing. Well, one of the things they found early on, anytime you're in space for a long time, you're in microgravity. Now, it's not weightlessness. There's a funny thing about that. The space station is only about 200 miles above the Earth. If that space station were to stop, not, ro not fly around the Earth, it would come crashing straight down to the ground. There's, there's gravity there. It's going to pull it down. But it's simply because it's going at a lateral distance away from the Earth that it's like throwing a football and it keeps falling over the horizon because it's going fast enough so as it starts to fall, the end of the Earth is there and it just keeps falling and that's really what an orbit is. So the term they use is microgravity. It's literally you're falling constantly. You know that feeling you get in an elevator when it's so, or in, a, in, a, in an amusement ride, <laughs> right? When you drop like that, it's like that all the time. But the thing is you adapt to it immediately and so it doesn't feel like your stomach is falling out. It's just that you're, it looks like you're floating, but really everything is falling constantly. So they call it microgravity. Now, the point I'm leading up to here is that you, f you float around, there is no such thing as weight, and therefore you have, uh, you, have no, uh, you have no resistance on your body. I didn't see you because there was a light right behind your head. Yes, sir? Right. How far out would you have to go to have true weightlessness? Actually, there is no such place because no matter where you are in the universe, something is pulling on you, although it's minute. So it's, uh, gravity is an interesting thing, it's infinite. In fact, you're pulling on me right now because we have mass. I got more than you, but it's, 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 it's mass. So if you have mass, it pulls on you. But the farther the distance is, the weaker it is. So that's why, look at the moon. The moon is held to the Earth because of our gravity. And so the things, but if you, no matter where you go, comets that are way out at the end of our solar system get tugged by the sun. It takes them years to come in, but they'll be coming in. So there really, there really is, uh, mathematically, that's, there's no such place. Good question. So when you're in space for an extended period of time, like at least uh, a couple of months, your bones and your muscles say, I have no weight to worry about. Muscles say, I don't have to worry about keeping my strength up to move my body around. There's no resistance. So your muscles start to atrophy. They become, they, they, they lose muscle mass. The same thing with your bones. Uh, what happens to the young physically fit astronauts is they, they come back looking like 80 year old people because their uh, uh, calcification has happened in their bones, uh, osteoporosis basically. And so they recognize this right away and so a lot of the medical uh, profession has come up with lots of cool drugs and things to help their bodies adapt to weightlessness and prevent those things from happening. But guess what? The one thing that, uh, that takes care of everything is the one thing we all kind of don't like, exercise. <laughs> they have to exercise, and that's what you see here. You see this young lady on a, they all call them resistive exercise devices because there's no gravity there. So they actually have to design machines with springs in them, and, and that adds resistance when they move them. So that's actually like a, a stepper. And so she's stepping there, like a, a, a step type of uh, exercise device, and that's strengthening her, uh, her leg muscles and whatnot. On the upper left is the old-fashioned treadmill, but the thing is, you can imagine being weightless in a treadmill, you'd go flying <laughs> right off the end of it with, uh, with no, nothing to hold you down. And so you can see he's in a harness that has to literally hold him down to the treadmill as he, as he uh, does his exercise. Same thing here, another resistive device, this is kind of like pull-ups uh, over here. And so they have several of these things, and they have to exercise two hours every day. Two hours every day, just like I do. And, uh, and the thing is, that's to keep up their muscle mass and whatnot, and they found that it works pretty good. And so that's one thing that they've accomplished and they've learned how to do. So it's the combination of uh, the uh, medicines that they take plus the exercise keeps them in shape. That's a bicycle there on the right. Um, you, uh, you probably recognize the fellow on the right. He's gained in popularity now. He's got his own show, but that's Stephen Colbert. On the left is Suni Williams. She's a veteran ISS astronaut. And the thing is, is that if you watch his show, he's a big space buff. And he wanted to have, every time they sent up a new module, they sometimes had a lottery to name it. Uh, they would have the children send in names and things like that. And so he wanted a module named for himself. And so, uh, you know, uh, he said, I got a big announcement. 
a NASA astronaut's coming to my show to give me to tell me something and he goes oh boy maybe they're gonna they're gonna name a module for me and so she appeared on the show and she says I've got some good news for you and what they did is they needed a new type of resistive uh, exercise device that they developed and this is what it is. I can't exactly tell you how it works, but you can see it's got all kinds of cool parts and can do things, and it's going to help the astronauts exercise. And so she said, we named it for you. <laughs> 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 so it's the, you know, NASA and their acronyms, right? So it's the Combined Operational Load-Bearing External Resistance Treadmill, the Colbert. <laughs> <laughs> And so there's the sticker, and it really is on the space station, and he was a happy, happy man. <laughs> okay, um, if you've ever gone camping, if you've ever been stuck in a camping trailer while it's rained for a day or something like that, that's probably what it's like to be on the space station. It's really not much different. They had to develop an environment where your air can be recycled, where your wastes can be recycled, you needed to have food, and you needed to have oxygen. And, and water. And so all these things had to be taken care of, and they have. The space station has been up now for almost 20 years, and it, everything is, knock on wood, working just fine. This is the way they eat, okay? These are floating packages of food. Um, the food is actually pretty good, I'm told. Um, it's not back in the days of the early astronauts where it came like in a toothpaste holder. Um, there's apricot juice there on the left, there's a can of uh, vegetables, lasagna in that pack. And so it's kind of like the military MREs or any kind of camping food. It's just sometimes freeze-dried or dehydrated and sent on up to them. So once they add water to it, put it in their microwave, you know, they've got a pretty good meal. And this is what mealtime looks like. The only thing about mealtime that's different on the space station than on Earth is the thing is everything wants to float away. And so you'll see the table has lots of white tape on it. And what are those? They're Velcro strips that are down on the table. And so if you take something out, you can't just set it down. You've got to stick it under something or stick it on something. And that's kind of how you wait the way you eat. But you see they have spoons and things like that, just like normal. And so that's dinner time with a visiting, uh, a visiting uh, shuttle crew. The thing is now, what do you do after you've had a nice meal besides take a nap? What do you do? Exercise, very good. Not right after you eat, though. What's the next thing you do? Where's the young lady I was here? What do you do next? You go to the bathroom. Go to the bathroom. That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, and so the thing is, there it is, okay? Everybody wants to know. Let me go over here again. Everybody wants to know, okay, how do you do your business in space? Well, quite frankly, you do it there the same way we do it down here. The only thing is we got a fluids problem, right? Things tend to float. And so you'll see there are kind of like straps and things to hold down your feet and uh, the usual type of equipment necessary to do it. Now, I found a short video uh, where an astronaut talks about this, and he does it much better than I can. So let me just switch to this video for a second, and you can uh, listen firsthand from an astronaut on how this gets done. Why 
<laughs> I told you I couldn't do it any better than he. <laughs> so that's uh, that's pretty much how it is. And uh, and if you listen to, again, you can go on uh, YouTube. It's a wonderful place. There's tons of videos now about the astronauts talking about how things are done, how they wash and clean and stuff. And uh, it's all it's all uh, you know just uh, pretty much like being in a camper. Um, haircut? Need a haircut? Oh, oh, by the way, astronauts are up there for about six months only because that's about the limit of what they've learned on how to take care of the body with the drugs and the exercise. Now, there's an experiment I'll talk about now where they're testing now, staying up there for a year. But they keep the astronauts up there for basically six months. So in that six months, your hair grows uh, for some of us. And so you got to do a, have a haircut. And as you can see, you get the scissors and comb. But you can see the thing in her right hand is a vacuum. And so they want to vacuum up the little hairs as they come off their head. Uh, washing, uh, yeah, no showers, because that would be just ridiculous. Uh, water bubbles, and it's not going to stick to you. And so what they have are all kinds of uh, lotions and soaps that you can put in your hair, and then you just towel dry it out. That's all. Same thing with your skin. They kind of just wipe it on their skin, wipe it off with a towel, and they stay clean and fresh that way. They have a great supply of fresh uniforms. Nobody wants a smelly astronaut next to you on the space station. So everybody keeps nice and, nice and clean. Uh, again, hair is an interesting thing. This is Sandy Magnus down here on Earth. There she is up in space. I'm sure she <laughs> hates that picture. Um, I forget her name, but uh, look at her ponytail just uh, sticking straight out into space. Uh, and then here's somebody who has solved the problem like I have. <laughs> but this is uh, one of the science modules. So uh, there are all these modules, and, and each one is different, but they're basically laboratories. They're laboratories where they have experiments to do. Uh, each astronaut works about 35 hours a day. Uh, s most of that is with experiments, and the other half is, guess what, maintenance. Cleaning things, cleaning filters, uh, changing light bulbs, uh, updating computers. <laughs> And, and other things that they have to do. And so this is, uh, they use all the walls of the uh, compartments. Uh, look at all the laptops and computers. You know, 98, uh, the laptops weren't as prevalent as they are uh, now. And so, uh, thank goodness, because they can do a lot more with things like that. Uh, sleeping. Sleeping uh, is another interesting thing. Actually, quite easy. Um, you really don't do anything. There's no such thing as a bed, no pillows, because again, there's no weight to have to cushion you. So you just kind of close your eyes and relax. You automatically go into the fetal position, your hands come up. You've probably done this in a pool sometimes, right, where you're just relaxing in a pool and you just go into that position. Same thing in space. But they don't want to bump into each other or the instruments or the experiments, so what they have are uh, they have a couple of options. They can uh, tie themselves up and pin themselves to the wall uh, in a sleeping bag like that. They can go into a little closet like that and close the door and turn a light on, read, communicate with Earth if they want. But that's their little cubby hole, and, and that's how they sleep. Uh, sometimes they wear, uh, yeah, sometimes they wear masks to keep out some light. This is actually on the space shuttle, so it wasn't as convenient. But uh, you can see, uh, you just uh, get your sleep the way normally uh, you would do here on Earth. Uh, I hear tell they dream, just like on Earth and, and everything else. So nothing different about that. Um, I'll play this video a little later. Um, uh, you see lots of interesting, cool pictures of the station. It can be seen easily from your backyard. Not every night, but you can easily see it. It's a, as you can see, it was a big, big object. It still is a big object. And it reflects the light very easily. So um, there's a website I'll tell you where to go to. And if it's passing over your house that night, you can easily see it going across the sky uh, gracefully uh, as a bright light. This uh, amateur astronomer happened to take it as it was going in front of the moon. And you can actually see the silhouette of it. That's a time lapse as it's going right across the moon. Can you find the spacewalker in this shot? Where is he? Right there. That's right, right there. There he is. So uh, this is, again, sometimes they have to go outside to do work. There are pumps, the gyroscopes, things like that. Things need to be changed and fixed, so they go outside when they have to. And uh, that main structure you see there is what we call the truss. There's nobody living in that, but that's the main girders that support the entire system <coughs> and, the, uh, and the solar arrays. Uh, you're always afraid that an astronaut's going to get uh, pulled off the station for some reason. 
And by the way, if you haven't seen the movie Gravity, I love it. It's terrific. It's pretty accurate, too. There's some inaccuracies, but it's a great, great movie. And poor Sandra Bullock got thrown off uh, the space shuttle and kind of shows you what happens. Well, they have a safety device that they always carry on them just in case. It's a mini jet pack, and it's called the Safer, and it's on the back of their suits. So if they ever do come off the station, they should be able to get back without too much trouble. But as the rule goes, they're always tethered, uh, just like mountain climbers are, to a mountain as when they're outside. Canada's big, uh, big donation to the space, big uh, contribution to the space station has been their Canada Arm. It's a multi-linked device that actually is like on a rail that goes right across that truss segment. And so with that, they can use, they can manipulate the arm from inside and they can grab cargo, grab astronauts, grab satellites, and do all kinds of mechanical things outside the station without having to go outside. And it's called, uh, conveniently, the Canada Arm. Canada Arm 1 was on the space shuttles, Canada Arm 2 is on the space station. They have this fellow too. They kind of took that same Canada Arms uh, scenario and they put lots of small little links on it and they kind of made it like into a little robot. They called it Dexter and uh, same thing. They're experimenting with that to use that to, uh, as you can see, he's got a drill in his hand to do uh, different things outside. I haven't heard much about that lately, so I don't know how much they're using that. Um, that's Dexter. Again, all his little mechanical parts. This was something that wasn't added until several years into the system. It's going to make you feel a little bit queez queasy, but the thing is, it's something that had to be done. Liquid recycling. It's important. Uh, water is heavy. Uh, to take water up on a rocket to the space station is very costly, and they need lots of water uh, to, of course, to, uh, uh, for eating and, uh, and drinking and, and cleaning. And so the thing is, you want to recycle as much as you can. And so, no, Howard Wallowitz did not do this on the Big Bang Theory, OK? <laughs> he did not create this. But this is the machine that they got perfected that's on the space station that takes every bit of, of, of waste water and recycles it into pure, pure drinking water. I mean everything, OK? Mm -hmm. You heard the gentleman talking before about going into the tube. That goes here. Also, sweat, condensation that gets absorbed by the filters all goes into the system and comes out purified drinking water and that saves a lot of, of time and expense and so it's a wonderful machine. Now talk about research on the space station and when I say it's above the earth for the earth the, the techniques and the, uh, and the engineering that went into this device they're using in third world countries to help purify water in some polluted areas and whatnot. So these are all the offshoots that always happen with regard to anything that the space agency does. Now, how do you get up and down? Uh, and that right now is limited to the Russian uh, space vehicles. The space shuttle for the United States has been retired. So we have to rely now on the Russian vehicles until other commercial um, companies here in the United States like SpaceX and Boeing are going to make some uh, ships that can go back and forth. But right now, this is the way uh, back and forth. It's called a Russian um, Soyuz. I'm, I'm incorrect here. This is the progress. This is strictly a supply ship, but they look the same. This is how it gets the station. One of the ways the station gets resupplied. You send this up. And it's a Russian rocket on the lower left that does this. It's broken down into three sections. The front section is where the cargo is. The second section is fuel. And the last section is how it, it propels itself in space. This is how it looks when it's coming into the station. And it docks. So here you can see the station. And it happens to have two supply ships attached to it, one on the end there, one below. And then you see the Soyuz vehicles there on top and bottom. And those are the way the astronauts get back and forth. Six astronauts on the space station. Each Soyuz can hold three. So there's always two on the station at all times in case there's any kind of an emergency evacuation, which has never happened so far. There's a couple of other ways the station gets uh, supplied. Remember, it's a 15-nation effort. And so again, Russia has the progress. Uh, SpaceX, the United States, has the Dragon capsule, which goes up, and Japan has the, and Europe has the HTV. It's nothing but a big cargo container that goes up on a rocket and gets, uh, uh, and gets attached to the station. This is what one of the cargo containers looks like. It's a big cylinder with lots of fresh supplies. 
there's another shot of it as it's coming into the station. Now when these come up, th like he said on the video, they empty out the supplies, they stay there for a while, then they put all the waste in there, old clothes, garbage, whatever it is, used equipment, and the other stuff, and they shove it in that, and that just falls back to earth, but when it does, it doesn't get recovered. It burns up in the atmosphere, and, uh, and that's the way that ends. Not so with the Dragon capsule from SpaceX. That actually lands in the water and can be reused. This is Robonaut. They're actually built uh, a robot. It's uh, just the top half of the torso of like a human body. And they're using that too to experiment with doing uh, tasks outside the station. So all these are experiments to do, uh, to do things to help the people in space. This is just another one of the laboratory. This is where they're goofing around showing weightlessness. There's cameras floating off to the right. And this is a shot that I, I really particularly like. Um, this is astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson, a very attractive young lady. There she is in her typical NASA pose with her hands nicely cold like this, the flag and the shuttle there, the nice smile on her face, her hair just perfect, right? This is nothing compared to this next shot. This next shot is my best, best picture. I love it. There she is on the space station, relaxing, looking out in a, in a part of the station called the, the, the cupola. And that has got all windows just facing down toward the Earth. I mean, talk about being on top of the world. Wouldn't you want to do that? I agree with you. Me too. All right? So for all the young people in here, okay, you can do this. All right? This is possible. This is within your realm. All right? But look at that. Being on top of the world. Her hair, she doesn't care. It's, it's weightless. She doesn't have to worry about anything. But just look at that. It's a beautiful, beautiful shot. I think it encapsulates uh, what being an astronaut's all about. There's the view from outside looking in. That's the cupola. Uh, and again, it's interesting. It was one of the last things put on the space station. And the astronaut said they had to have it because this way they can look out the windows and help guide spaceships in. Mm. Yeah. They, wa <laughs> they, wanted that, they wanted that porch view. And I don't blame them. They deserve it. <laughs> There's another shot of the same thing. Um, beautiful, beautiful shot. Of course, you know, once somebody uses it, then someone else has to top it. And so I know we have some guitar people here tonight. But so, see, there you go. You can bring up your guitar, play it in the cupola, and be right over the entire Earth. Of course, astronauts are competitive types. And so how many astronauts can you get <laughs> in, the, in the cupola at one time? So all the women got together, and there's uh, four of them, four or five of them, I think, in there. And then the men didn't want to be outdone, uh, and the women. This is a shuttle crew. They decided to squeeze in there. And away you go. So finishing up, the, uh, other th one of the other things that the, sh the station is used for is observation of the Earth, uh, because we can certainly use a lot of help. And so this is actually a, uh, a, uh, an er uh, a, a, vol yeah. a volcano that erupted. And so they can see the cloud patterns and how it's the ash is going into the air. Um, this is uh, also you know, some high resolution photography from, uh, from space. Um, this is actually Honolulu, and uh, now Scott Kelly is, uh, is one of the people that's going to be in space for a year, and what he's doing, and this is fun if you want to do this, every Wednesday on Twitter, he tweets a picture from space, but he doesn't identify it. If you can identify it, what it is correctly, be the first one to tweet him back with the correct identification, when he comes back, he will autograph the picture for you, okay? So that's every Wednesday. Um, anybody know where that is? Dubai. That's right. That's Dubai. All right. This astronaut took this, the Palm Islands in Dubai. Um, this is Mount Ararat, uh, snow-capped. Uh, and uh, now, uh, for some reason, I've thrown back in how we get back to Earth. There's the, uh, now, oh, this is how you're getting back. It looks very similar to that Progress vehicle, but this is now the Soyuz. This is made for astronauts. So again, three sections. The top bulbous part is what they call the orbital piece. The middle, though, is the only thing that comes back to Earth. That's where the three astronauts go. And the last piece are the engines and the instruments. So that would undock from the space station when you want to come back after your six months in space. That's a picture of it leaving. Again, the astronauts are in that section on the left. Um, they're landing in Russia. And when they land in Russia, they really land on land. And so there's a nice one big parachute as they come down. And just before they hit the ground, jets fire. And so that's not a crash landing. What it is is the jets fire just before uh, it hits the ground to help cushion it. And usually there's a lot of dirt and dust that gets kicked up. So that's a successful landing, believe it or not. And then, uh, of course, 
being uh, six months in space, still, all of a sudden, you're back in gravity right now, and it's very trying on you, even though you've been keeping fit with the exercise. And so that's all that's left from those three segments, just the middle segment. And so the Russian recovery crew is there to help you out. And they put this little uh, assembly over the top to help get you out. And then you get out and you go down a little slide <laughs> and to the waiting arms of more recovery crew people. And then they throw you in a chase lounge chair and they sit you there and the nurses come up and check your blood pressure, make sure you're okay. You get on the phone, like on the right there, and on the left, call home, say, hi, mom, I'm okay. There's the, there's the uh, module in the background. And that's how you, uh, and that's how you come back. A um, couple other pictures from space. What's that? Yes? Giza. That's right. The pyramids at Giza. Very good. <coughs> and this is now space looking down. Now, it's interesting. There's not a lot of pictures of space space from the space station. It's pictures of the Earth. But I finally found one you know, that shows the Milky Way and the beautiful stars that you can see. And so that's just amazing uh, what you can see. Uh, that's probably the moon on the upper left. That's not Saturn. That's probably the moon. But the other thing I want to call your attention to is, you know what this is right here? That's it. That's our atmosphere. It's not much. It's only about 100 miles above, 80 to 100 miles above the Earth. That's it. Big Earth, 8,000 miles wide, that's all we have to protect us, and that's all we have to live on. So that's why everybody says we've got to take care of it. That's just another shot of the same thing. But again, look at the stars uh, as they go around the horizon. Another volcano, this is the, uh, in the Aleutians in 2006. What's that? Italy. Yay, that's right, Italy and Sicily, beautiful shot, cloudless day. And I think this is my last slide. Somebody tell me what this is. This is a picture taken from the station, looking down on the Earth. Okay, not trick photography or anything, but there's this big, dark smudge right there. Okay, what do you think? Sandstorm? Sandstorm, no. Yes? Shadow of the moon, very good, which means what's going on? An eclipse, that's right. This is what it looks like from the space station from a total solar eclipse, okay? So the moon comes between the sun and the earth and it casts a perfectly round shadow on the earth. It looks smudgy because we've got clouds and atmosphere, but that's what it looks like. If you were underneath that dark spot, you would be in total darkness and it would look like a total eclipse of the sun to you there. The reason I also bring this up is that in 2017, just less than two years from now, there's going to be a total solar eclipse here in the United States that's going to go from Oregon down to South Carolina. So plan your vacations well and make sure you're on that central line. That I kid you not, it's the only one in this country in our lifetime. So look it up, solar eclipse, August 2017. You want to be somewhere in that line. I'm going to Wyoming myself. And that's where I figured it's not going to be too many clouds myself. But see it, that'll be great. Okay, last couple of slides, I'm sorry. Um, the gentleman on the, life is, on the left is Scott Kelly, and the gentleman on the right is a Russian, I can't pronounce his name, I'm so sorry. But the thing is, uh, these two gentlemen are going, have decided to be an experiment, and they're gonna stay in space for a whole year. Uh, they're almost at their halfway point now. And again, it's to test how their body reacts to uh, gr microgravity for a year. What's interesting about Scott is that he has a twin brother on the Earth, who is also an astronaut. And so we've got a great comparison. This is Scott in the uh, module with the spacesuits. And there he is with his twin brother. And, uh, and uh, so it's going to be interesting to compare their bodies uh, once he comes back from space. So it's called the One Year Mission. Uh, and like I said, this is just a reminder, you can see the space station. It's, you go to any uh, NASA website about seeing the ISS, uh, and you, it'll tell you the exact time and date to look in your backyard. Um, most of these people are test pilots and, and whatnot, and you know what you got to have. You got to have a group team picture, right? And so once the expeditions got higher and higher, they said we got to have a, a, a team photo. And so here's Expedition 41, and you know they're, they're posing and they got all their 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 their, uh, their insignia and everything in the background. That looks pretty cool, right? Expedition 41. Here's Expedition 34 with the theme. I'm telling you, off the Earth for the Earth. Pretty nice, right? Well, you know how people are. They want to jazz this up just a little bit more. And so, <laughs> <laughs> here's, 
Here's Expedition, what is that now, 45? That's Expedition 45. There's Scott Kelly, by the way, on the lower right, okay? And so the next expedition said, well, we got to top this, right? So there they are, okay? <laughs> and they're going to keep going, right? So now we've got <laughs> pilots of the Caribbean. Pilots of the Caribbean. These are the real astronauts, okay? And uh, for those of us that are older, you youngins, you youngins aren't going to understand this. Ask the older folks. Yep. Ask the older folks. Notice the bare feet, too, right? Okay. And then what's this? Matrix. Matrix. The older folks aren't going to know this, and the younger folks are. Okay. And so thank you very much. That's the uh, end of my talk. So, so hopefully now you know a little bit more about how they live and work in space. Any questions? I know we have a full crowd here, and I can, I'll be around too later if you want to talk to me. But any quick questions? Yes, sir. They train together for over a year. That's why. So if anyone's not going to get along, it'll all come out in the wash right there. That's a good question, though. Yeah. yeah. But and you know what the other thing is? They're so darn busy, they don't have time to have, to have that kind of stuff. They're either working or sleeping. Yes, sir? What's the uh, official language up there? Uh, it's both English and Russian. Yeah, the, English, the Americans learn Russian. The Russians learn English. They, they, it's amazing. You watch some of those videos. They talk to each other in both languages. Mm. It's fantastic. There is no official language. Yes. That's a good point. I never even touched upon that. Uh, guess how they make oxygen in space? They don't bring up bottles of oxygen. Anybody have an idea how they make the oxygen? Plants? No, th plants eventually. That's the only way it's going to be. But water. yes, water, water. They found that if they take water up, even though it's heavy, and they uh, hydrolyze it, it breaks it up into hydrogen and oxygen, and that's how they get their oxygen. Eventually, they want to use the hydrogen for fuel, but right now they're sending that overboard. But they constantly regenerate it by using uh, water bags, and, 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 and they bring up water, not, not oxygen tanks. It's more efficient that way. Yes? Come on up, John. Come on up and tell them what they can do. No, come on up. That's it? OK. All right, so I, uh, I guess the sky conditions are better? OK, so, uh, well, yeah, sort of. OK. All right, so. I'll be around. Yes, sir. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, what are we, 2015 now? I think 2023 is about all it's funded for. Uh, but who knows? The Russians are talking about taking their pieces and going their own way at that time. So stay tuned. But right now, it's up there for at least another five to seven years. Yeah. Thank you very much again, ladies and gentlemen. I will answer your questions uh, as I can. It is hot. I want you to move around. I'm sorry. OK. I did it before, Jim, but I will do it again. You got it. OK, it's all right. My, the president just reminds me once again, if you've enjoyed the presentation, help us keep this going by dropping something in our donation box in the back, please. OK? All right, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>